All right, we're looking tonight in our uh, continuing study here on end time prophecy. We're looking at the blessed hope, the rapture. And I guess I answered the question, the first question on your notes there. What is the hope of all believers? Open your Bible to Titus 2.13. Open your Bible to Titus chapter 2, verse 13. And as we open that up and answer the question, what, what is the hope of all believers, I'd like you to think about this. What does the word hope mean in the Bible? What does the word hope mean in the Bible? Looking for something in the future. All right, looking for something in the future. That was one idea. Somebody else. Let me, let me ask the question this way. Does it mean, like when the boys and girls use the word uh, sometimes in wanting to get out of school, like they say, I hope it snows tomorrow so we don't have to, you know, so we have off school. Is that what it means? I hope like that? No. No. That's an okay word, use of the word hope, but that's not what it means. The word hope means in the Bible... It means an absolute, positive, concrete fact. It means a fact. Not something that might happen. Not something that, uh, you know, is uncertain. It, it's a certainty. A certainty. So somebody read for us Titus chapter 2, verse 13, please. Looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, thank you, Alvin. Looking for the blessed, the blessed hope, which it defines right there, is the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that interesting that in that right verse right there, it says that Jesus is God. It says he's the great God and our Savior. And that's the blessed hope. And in a future study here, I'll show you how I know that the church is not going to go through the tribulation. There are believers today who think that, who say that. That's a new popular, new popular, you know, kind of thing, but it's not new. Uh, I told my father about that when I <coughs> back and he passed away in 1990, but I remember when a book came out by a guy that changed his position, and uh, he, he went to, to uh, instead of believing in the church being raptured, he believed that we would be staying for half of it. And he wrote a book called The Pre-Wrath Rapture of the Church, and then he sent it out to all preachers across America. And I said to my father, what do you think of that book that guy wrote? I said, you know, what's with that? And he said, oh, that's nothing new. He said, that's not new. He said, that's just, they just got a new word for it, and it's the old, old mid-trib, you know, middle of the tribulation, mid-trib rapture. And I, I'm sure that we're not going to be here for any of the tribulation. That's another study, okay? I'll give you reasons another night, a bunch of reasons how we know that. Right now, let's go to John 14. We're going to look at, and, and I didn't, on your notes, I left your room there to write so you could write down the references and things. And that way you hopefully uh, catch a little more of this. The revealing of the rapture. It's first revealed by Jesus to his disciples. It's revealed to Jesus. And it's a funny thing. We talked about this before another night here last year. Uh, we don't think about this passage oftentimes as, as the, about the rapture because we, we use it a lot where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that's true. John 14, 6. But notice what he says in the first part of John 14. He says to his followers, don't be troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. They, they were afraid because Jesus was starting to tell them that he was leaving. He was going to die on the cross and leave, and they didn't like that. So they were, they were being upset. He said, don't be, don't be upset. 
he said, I'm going away, verse 2, to prepare a place for you. I am going away to prepare a place. And since I go and prepare a place for you, watch. Watch this promise. Since I'm going to prepare a place for you, that word if doesn't mean if it happens. It means since it's going to happen. Since I'm going to prepare a place for you, watch. I will come again. Okay. I will come again. No doubt. No maybe. I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there what? You can be also. That's the promise. That's the promise that Jesus made. Okay, Jesus first made the promise there in, in the New Testament. Now notice the place that he talks about. The place is in verse 2. In my father's house. In my father's house are many mansions. Some translations say many dwelling places. If it wasn't so, I would have told you I'm going to prepare a place for you. Now, listen to this. The, the father's house is huge. The father's house is huge. Let me tell you how huge it is, how big this place is. It's big enough for all the people that want to be there. That's how big it is. And it's, I can tell you the dimensions. Revelation 21, 16. Write that down. And then write down this number. 1,500 miles cubed. Cubed. What's that mean when we say 1,500 miles cubed? Yeah, all directions. Not just length and width, but height. That's in Revelation 21, 16. Now, it puts it in, in cubits in Revelation 21, 16. you got to just translate the cubits, which is 18 inches, to miles, and you can do that, and that's what you come up with. In other words, it would be 2,250,000 square or cubed miles. Big. There's no city like that anywhere in the world. We don't have city. We think a city's big if it's, you know, what's the, what's the largest city in America? New York. L.A.? No. L.A. or New York or Chicago, right? Well, how wide are they at their widest part, parts? Not wide. Maybe, maybe some of them be 20, 30 miles. I don't know. This is amazing. See, this is 1,500 miles. You know how far that is? In the United States, how, if you were driving... Half, yeah, halfway across the country. Because the country is about 3,000 miles wide. And Alvin, you could almost get down to down to Florida with that, couldn't you? <laughs> you get down to Fort Lauderdale, Pompano Beach, 1,500 miles. Yeah. Is that, um, not to interrupt, but is that when the end of the thousand-year millennium? Yes. Is that when that... Uh, New Jerusalem come down. Is, is that what you're referring to as far as uh, the 1,500 miles? That's a good question. Because it seems like there's more than one place. That's coming in the rapture. There's the New Jerusalem. That's yeah. right. There's the city. Heaven. There's, heaven, right? there's the holy city. Well, wait a minute now. There's the New Jerusalem and the city which is coming down from heaven. From God. It comes down from God out of heaven this city, all right? And all indications are that we are given full access, much more than any Hollywood total access show, we're given full access to both the city, the heavenly city of the New Jerusalem and the place called heaven. Now let's go to, in, the dimensions I gave you are for that city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, okay? So in Revelation 21.10, John talks about this city. 
He carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So that's the city. That's the heavenly city, New Jerusalem, 1,500 miles cubed. And it is, it is like nothing that we've ever seen before. And it has gates. It has gates that are three gates on each side. They're, they're the size of pearls, big pearls. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls, verse 21. Each individual gate was of one pearl. The street of the city was pure gold. Now here's a, here's a neat thought for you. What color is gold? Clear. Pure gold is clear. Yeah, I, you knew because it says like transparent glass. We don't have any pure gold in, in our in the world. See, our gold is yellow. This is pure. And this is heaven. This is heaven. That's the new heaven and the new earth. <coughs> now, the word prepare. I'm going to prepare a place for you. That doesn't mean to build it. It means to make it ready. Where Jesus says, I go to prepare a place. He's not saying I'm going to build it. It was already built. He says, I'm going to get it ready for you. I'm going to get it ready for you. Now, watch this. We have what next we call number, the third thing we have here is the reception. And when we say that, we're not talking about any kind of formal gathering. We're talking about how, how we're received. Notice Jesus says, I will come again and receive you. Verse 3. I will come again and receive you to myself. See, just as personally and literally as Jesus went to heaven, he says he's coming back to receive us unto himself. Now the disciples, see, they didn't have any concept of the rapture. They, they didn't understand this. This whole idea went right over their heads. You know, I know it. You know, I know it went over their heads. Look at Thomas's question. What's Thomas say? Because Jesus says to him, to them all, well, where I'm going, you all know, and you know the way. What's Thomas say? We do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Yeah. We don't know where you're going. See, they, they, were, not, they were not in the know yet. They were in the dark. And we know that not only because of that scripture and the answer that Jesus gave when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We know it also from their question in Acts 1, 6. And I've showed you this question often before, but leave John 14 now and go to Acts chapter 1. Because the disciples thought that Jesus was going to save, save the nation Israel from the Romans. They expected Jesus to be a conquering Messiah. Because they were, they were subjugated by Rome. And so in verse 6 of Acts 1, this is after the resurrection, okay? We know that from verse 3. He presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them 40 days, <coughs> speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. That's, that's the promise of the Holy Spirit. He said, and it says, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, now watch the question. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom right now to Israel? What did they think? They thought he was. They thought he was. And they thought it was going to be an earthly, physical kingdom, right? They thought somehow he was going to lead a revolution against the, against the Roman Empire and overthrow Rome and liberate Israel. Watch how he answers them. Now, see, this again shows that their reception of this, their, their understanding wasn't good at all. He said to them, it's not for you to know. 
times or seasons because the Father has got that put in his own authority. He said, you don't need to worry about that. My Heavenly Father's taking care of that for me. And then he said, but you can worry about this. Take care of this. You're going to get the power when the Holy Spirit comes to be witnesses for me. In Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And then when he'd spoken these things, verse 9, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. <clears throat> so the disciples had no concept of going to heaven. They didn't understand that. Now a big question that I often get asked is this. What happens to a Christian when he dies? What happens to a Christian when he dies? And I'm going to answer that because we're going to get into the rapture and we're going to get into... Uh, the resurrection and all that in a moment. We're going to look at the plan of the rapture. But before we do, let's let's answer the question, what happens to a Christian when he dies? Go to Philippians chapter 1, please. I'm going to show you this in two places. Philippians 1, verses 20 to 23, and then 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. That answers that question. What happens to a Christian when he dies? Philippians 1, 20 to 23, and 2 Corinthians 5, 6 to 8. Now there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, misinformation out there. And there's a lot of people who think that when you die, you, you go into what they call soul sleep. That you're, you're kind of, you're, you're like a zombie until the resurrection. That's not what the Bible says. And by the way, let me just give you this piece of advice too. Uh, it would not be smart for you to ask a Bible question, or uh, smart's a bad word, I'm sorry. It wouldn't be the wisest thing in the world to ask a Bible question to Google. Okay? No. <laughs> I'm serious. In fact, Somebody shared something with me the other day, and because I'm on the internet right now, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put it out there because I don't want to get get deleted. But somebody shared with me a terrible, terrible, terrible piece of misinformation that was put out about a ministry of children, a, a Christian ministry of children. And here it was the second thing that came up in Google search engine. Second thing. And I thought, sure, it might be a an ad, you know, somebody, some, some atheist group putting an ad. And I went and checked it out for myself. It wasn't an ad. It was just there. Mm -hmm. See, that's why you, you, can't, you can't just automatically assume if it's religious, it's automatically true because there's lots of false, false teaching. And I don't ask people to believe me because I'm saying it. I ask them to check me with the Bible, all right? So I don't, I don't have any fear of that. Let's look at Philippians 1, 20 to 23. What the Apostle Paul knew about when he died. He said, I eagerly expect, I'll start reading in verse 20, and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. So Paul says, I want Jesus Christ to be glorified, whether I live or whether I die. He said, for, to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So for a child of God, when you have eternal life and you're saved, you can't lose. Living is Christ and dying is gain. Now watch what Paul says. If I am, go, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. Now watch verse 23. Here's the answer to the question, what happens to a Christian when they die? I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. Right. Now what's, what does that tell us about what Paul knew when he died? He's going to be with Christ. He didn't say, I'm, I desire... To depart and go floating off in soul sleep somewhere. See? Not when he 
in paradise, correct? Not heaven. Not where, where your soul goes. No, that'll be heaven because well, when when Jesus when Jesus resurrected, he he emptied paradise. He took paradise with him to heaven. He led captivity captive. Ephesians chapter four. That's another whole. That's another whole. Well, well the reason I ask that. Go ahead. Jesus said to the well, to the thief, "Today you'll be with me in paradise." Jesus went to paradise, mm -hmm. but when he was resurrected, he took with him to heaven all the souls of of all those people that were in paradise to heaven. Okay, what I'm getting at is there's somewhere, I can't remember, where it was either Paul said, no one's been to heaven, the third heaven where God is. Okay. Oh, I think you, I think you mean the, what he talks about, um, he talks about when he was taken up in a vision. I think that's what you mean, John. And he wasn't necessarily saying there, making any statement about about nobody going to heaven. He was talking about how he, when he get, he died, he, the time that he was left for dead on the garbage heap. And it's in Corinthians, um, and he said, "I was taken up into the third or th uh, into the third heaven. And I saw things were not lawful for anyone to see." And um, I can't put my finger on it right now, but that's the part, and I'll we'll, I'll I'll check that out for you for next week and get that. But he wasn't saying that nobody's been with God. He wasn't. He, I don't think I don't recall that phrase at all. I think he was saying that he was allowed to see things that nobody was allowed to see. I meant as a as a living human being, see, because he came back and he didn't tell. He didn't tell what he saw, mm -hmm. and that that kind of makes you wonder about all those books that are written, doesn't it? Or people say, I went to heaven and I saw all this. And then God sent me back. That's say. where I got it from because I was reading about people who were coming down with people who said they were in heaven yeah. and all that. And he, his guy gave a, a scripture verse saying, uh, nobody's been to heaven yet. Well, that's And I can't remember the verse. And yeah. you're right, maybe it was... Uh, I, mean, I, think it had, I think it had to do with... with with Paul's uh, Paul's talking about when when God uh, allowed him to uh, go up into the third heaven, and a lot of people believe that's when he was left for dead on the garbage heap at either Smyrna or Troas. Now let's go to the let's go to an, another even more definitive. Uh, by the way. In the next verse of right here, Philippians 1, Paul says, you know, I, I'm, I'm torn, I desire to part, depart and be with Christ. That's far better for me. But then watch what he said. He said, however, I know that probably I'm going to stay here because that's better for you. If I live in the flesh, he said, this will mean fruit for my labor, but to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Verse 24. So Paul knew that God had work for him to do. And that it wasn't his time yet to depart. Look at Second Corinthians five six to eight. Second Corinthians five six through eight. Verse 6, Paul says, We are always confident, watch this, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Because we're walking by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, and well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So when we're, when we're not with the Lord, we're in our bodies. When we're absent from the body, we're present with the Lord. So in other words, here's what that means. The moment that a believer dies, a believer has three parts. Okay, You and I are made of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Now, some people try to make it just be, make it be two parts, but 
there's a soul and a spirit. Your soul is your is your intellect, your personality, uh, your will, and your spirit is your God consciousness. But I believe this. I believe that your soul and your spirit go to heaven. Your body is disposed of by your relatives in one way or another. Your body doesn't last forever, does it? Once you're dead, you're dead. Your body, you know, it can be buried, but it's still not going to stay forever, okay? It can be cremated, it's not going to stay forever. It can be drowned in the sea, it's not, you know, it doesn't matter. But I'll show you that in just a little bit in Corinthians. So, when you're absent from your body, you're present with the Lord in heaven. And that's what the Bible calls, watch this, a spiritual body. It's your spirit. It's kind of like this. In, up in heaven right now, you have God and the angels and the departed saints, and they can all see each other and talk, okay? But they're spirits, all right? So you have spiritual eyes, and if you and I had our spiritual eyes that were, if God opened them right now, we would see angels in this room, okay? But we can't see spirits because we're not spirit beings, okay? We have the Holy Spirit inside of us, and we have our spirit, but we're not, we don't have our spiritual eyes. They're not, they're not quickened. They're not alive. When you die and go to heaven, instantly you're present with the Lord in heaven, and instantly you can see everything. Now, you don't have a body yet because your body's in the ground. And you don't get your new body till the resurrection, okay? Till the rapture. That's when, and we'll see that in Corinthians 15. So that means you're there as a spirit, spirit and soul. And, and I believe that's what Corinthians means when it talks about spiritual bodies, okay? And I, don't, I can't tell you what it looks like because I don't know. <laughs> you look puzzled, John. Uh, you look no, I, I just uh, uh, it's sometimes it's hard to understand. You know, you know, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's a, a mystery which we just don't understand. God. Well, right, exactly. And that's why that's why I like this verse, verse seven, where he says, "We walk by faith, not by sight." Yeah. Okay. In other words, I have total faith in God's word, and so I don't. Doesn't matter what I see, because. Uh, I can't see God, but he exists. And, you know, people don't see electricity, but they see the evidence of it. So I don't see God, but I see the evidence of him. You right? don't think uh, people, that, like your dad, for example, you don't think he can see what's going on down here? That's a, that's a good question. And I, here's what I think about whether they can see us or not. Some people say that they think we can, be, they can because in, in Hebrews chapter 12, it's he, Paul says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. Okay? So they say, there's a cloud of witnesses. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're sitting up there watching everything going on down here on the earth. Uh, what I think it means is this, that they are witnesses of the great faith that God has given. Okay? Because Hebrews chapter 11 is the hall of fame of faith. So they're witnessing to that faith. Okay? All those people, Abraham and, and Noah and Moses and all the ones that are listed there. Okay, So I don't think it means that they're watching us. I think it means, I think this. I don't think that they, I don't think that they, um, i got to be careful how I say this because I don't want to get anybody upset. <laughs> I, was gonna say, I don't think they care what's going on down there. But I don't mean... When I say that, I wouldn't mean that they didn't care about, like my father cares for me, so I don't mean he doesn't care yeah. about me. What I mean is this. Heaven, heaven is, no, and not I don't mean to know, heaven is such an amazing place that they're going to be enraptured with everything that's there. So it's almost like they could care less about the earth, what's going on down here. Frankly, they're, th they're glad to be out of it, yeah. okay? They're glad to be released from it. They're glad to be free from all the troubles and trials and the disease and all the pain down here, okay? Now, I believe that, I believe this, I believe that, that they can, 
they can get messages in heaven when a person is coming. Okay? Because I, and I, I can't give you a verse for that, but I know this. I know, I know this for a fact. I know that the angels, the Bible says, rejoice whenever a new person is, gets saved. So that, that means that in some way that God gets, there's messages allowed into heaven, okay? Messages like that. And I think that when a person is coming home, when a, when a believer is going to heaven, I think that their loved ones and relatives are let know that, that, that. Hey, they're coming to join you, see? And again, I can't, I can't prove that with a verse other than to say that would be a happy thing, okay? The other thing is this. There's no pain in heaven. There's no sadness. So it would be very sad if they looked down here and saw us messing up one day. <laughs> that, would, that wouldn't make anybody feel good, you know? Like, Max, if your mom or my mom or, you know, your grand, grandmother, sure. if they would see us, you know, down here and we made a big old goof, you know, would... <laughs> They'd say, I taught, my mom, so would say, I taught Billy better. <laughs> See, so that would be, you know, that wouldn't be anything to, that, that would be helpful. It wouldn't be productive. Right before Paul, you and I said, hey, dude, I've known you for a while now. You're like my grandfather. I said, please, when you get up there, will you put a good word in for me? <laughs> well, you know what I did when my friend Tom Black died? I almost, it was, it was amazing, and I never had this happen before, but I was with him there, there on his deathbed, uh, and he died at the, the hospice there at the Carolyn Croxton house there on Lingleton Road, and for some reason, and it was, I guess it was not that far away from, that was probably 2009, it would have been, you know, 19 years, but for some reason, I was missing my dad a lot, and I almost... I almost said to Tom, I didn't do it because I thought to myself, you dummy, just tell Jesus to tell him. Because I said, I, I almost said to Tom, hey, when you get up there, would you give my father a message for me? <laughs> I did, I thought of that. I thought, well, he could do that, see? No, 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 that's not. <laughs> what would be the sense of that, see? Funny things, the things that go through our mind as we think about Stuff that we don't know everything about, see? Yeah. Right? Now let's look at the plan of the rapture, okay? We'll get have a chance to get started on this. We'll get about 10 minutes. Phase one. We're calling it phase one. And this is in, in 1 Thessalonians. And the, the, the rapture part is in chapter four. But let me show you before we get to that, uh, the qualities of the church at Thessalonica, Okay. I want you to go to chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians because this puts into context for us what Paul says in chapter 4. Chapter 4 is the main passage about the rapture in the New Testament. And, but chapter 1 puts in context for us the, the believers at this church in Thessalonica. And I want you to notice especially what they, what they thought about and what they did in relation to the Lord's coming. I'm going to read just a couple of verses and highlight for you a couple of lines. Paul says in verse 2, now he's right, and by the way, Paul was the one that preached a revival meeting in, in Thessalonica for two weeks, three Sabbath days, two weeks, and a bunch of people got saved. He said, we thank God for all of you and pray for you constantly. As we talk to our God and Father about you, we think, now watch this, we think of your faithful work, verse 3, your loving deeds, now watch, and your continual anticipation of the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, they were looking for, that, that's, the, that's the word hope there in the King James, your, the patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. They were, they were looking, anticipating the Lord's return. And so he said, you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. As a result, you became examples to all the Christians in Greece. Thessalonica was a city in the, in the country of Greece. Now watch verse 8. Now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to people everywhere, even beyond Greece. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it. 
For they themselves keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the true and living God. That's a great testimony for those believers. Now look at verse 10. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead. He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. And that's, that's right there, that scripture is a reference to the tribulation. Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. Right? Now, that, so that, that was a church that had lots of great qualities. They were, they were surrendered, uh, and even though they were suffering, they were a soul-winning church, they were a second-coming church, they were sanctified, and they were, they were giving out the gospel everywhere. Now, Watch the question of the church. They were anticipating Jesus' return daily, and when it did not happen, they began to worry about his coming. They began to worry. And they began to, to wonder about their loved ones that had died. And so, in that context... That's their question. What's going on with the Lord's return? Why is he coming back? Because they didn't know how long it was going to be. See, they had no idea. So what's Paul say in 1 Thessalonians 4.13? He says, I do not want you to be ignorant. I want you to know what will happen to the Christians who have died. So you will not be full of sorrow like people who have no hope. That's a great line, isn't it? It's a great thought. See, there are some people who have no hope. And Paul said to these believers, I want you to know what happens to the Christians who have died. So you won't be full of sorrow like the other people, the unbelievers, see, who have no hope. So that was the question of the church. What's going to happen to our loved ones who have died? And here's the answer for the church. It starts in verse 14. The answer, he says, for since we believe Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe when Jesus comes, God will bring back with Jesus all the Christians who have died. So there we, there we have Paul's statement. God's going to bring back with Jesus all the Christians who have died. That's our spirits and souls. I can tell you this directly from the Lord. We are still living when the Lord returns will not rise to meet him ahead of those who are in the graves. Someone asked me one time, why did they get to go first, people in the graves? I said, I don't know, maybe it's because they got six feet further to go than we do. It, just, <laughs> it doesn't matter because it's all going to happen simultaneously. The Lord himself, verse 16, will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the call of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. First, all the Christians who have died and by the way, in the King James, it uses the word sleep there. And that word sleep means dead, okay? Those who have fallen asleep. That means they died. We will not precede those. We won't go ahead of those. He says, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. That's how I know that they're dead. They're not just sleeping. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth, will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and remain with him forever. So comfort and encourage each other with these words. So there's the answer for the church. See, that's, that's how Paul comforted them. He said, comfort yourselves. Don't, don't, don't worry. In fact, in the second book, and we're not going to go here tonight, but in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he answers them, because there were people who wrote letters and they faked his, his signature. They actually pretended to be Paul and they said, bad news, the Lord came back and you missed it. See, they were all, of course, they were all shook up. They thought Paul, had, and Paul said, don't, don't be troubled. I didn't write you any letter like that. That wasn't me. Here's the facts. And then he gives them the facts in, in chapter 2. And that's where he talks about the Antichrist and the man of sin and all of that. Okay. Now, Look at the, what we're calling phase two, the plan of the rapture. Go to, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we'll just begin to unpack this tonight. Verses 49, write the reference down. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 to 57. I want you to, first of all, I want you to understand about the mystery of the rapture. And that word, that word mystery is in verse 51. I tell you a mystery. So mark that word for yourself. Okay? First Corinthians 15, 51. I'm telling you a mystery. And I want to define that for you because it's very important you understand in the Bible what a mystery is. Okay? Here's what a mystery is. A mystery is a truth that was hidden in the Old Testament but revealed in the New Testament. That's what a mystery is. In the Bible, it's not something you can't know. It's a mystery. A mystery is something that they did not know. It was hidden. The truth was hidden in the Old Testament. The Old Testament saints didn't understand about the rapture. They didn't understand about the church. They didn't understand about Jesus dying on the cross. Okay? Those were all mysteries. They were hidden in the Old Testament. They were revealed in the New Testament. That's the mystery of the rapture. Now, he next gets into all the changes that are going to happen. And maybe I can get done this tonight. We'll try to do it. Verse 49, just as we are now like Adam, the man of the earth, so we will someday be like Christ, the man from heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These perishable bodies of ours are not able to live forever. But let me tell you a wonderful secret God has revealed to us. Not all of us will die, but we will all be transformed. Okay, here's the changes. We will all be changed, transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blinking of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, the Christians who have died will be raised with transformed bodies. And that's where I told you, your spirit and your soul comes back from heaven. And this is all in a, in a millisecond, okay? It says in a moment, a twinkle of an eye. So your spirit and your soul is reunited with your new, brand new glorified body. And watch, watch what it says about that body. And then we who are living will be transformed so we will never die. So your new body can't die. That's how it's different than the old body, one way. For our perishable, verse 53, earthly bodies must be transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die. When this happens, when our perishable earthly bodies have been transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die, then at last the scriptures will come true. Death is swallowed up in victory. Then he writes, death where is your victory, death where is your sting. Sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. How we thank God who gives us the victory over sin and death through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now look at verse 58. That's a great verse. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and steady. King James says, steadfast, unmovable. Always enthusiastic about the Lord's work. Now here's a great promise that all of us can take great comfort in. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. So Max, nothing that you ever do for the Lord as you take care of all those, those folks you take care of is never useless. That's good to know, isn't it? It is. <clears throat> because we don't always, people don't always appreciate what we do for them. And we sometimes think, wonder if this is doing any good. wonder if it's any, of any use, right? I mean, I, I thought that. And God says, nothing that we ever do for him is useless. See? And that means that he's keeping the books. He's keeping the records. So lots of changes, and they happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And that's when we are taken to heaven to be with the Lord. Now, what happens next? 
There's several things that happen next. On the earth, this is not tonight's study, but I'll just give it to you. We'll be talking about it in coming weeks. On the earth, the earth, the earth is going to go through tribulation. And so I'll, we'll, we'll deal with that next week. We'll talk about will the church go through tribulation, how I know it will not, okay? I'll give you notes about that. That's, that's on the earth. But in heaven, what are you and I going to be doing in heaven during the seven years? I can tell you. Well, no, the banquet's not yet. You'll, you'll have plenty to eat, but that's not what's in heaven. That's, what's not, that's not what's next. What's next is the word B-E-M-A. Bema seat. Is that where you stand? Bema seat. That's the judgment seat of Christ. Yes. And that's not, you're, it's no, you're not being judged for your sins because your sins were judged at the cross. That's a judgment of our works. 